I guess first off, I just want to recognize that we are meeting today on the territory of the Stenemo First Nation and also under the tenets of the Douglas Treaty of 1854. Um, some of you who have known Nault for a long time might be asking yourself, why is this guy talking? Why is Gail not up there? And uh, unfortunately, Gail has, um, is unable to attend due to injury. She would love to be here if she could and uh, we are poorer for her absence. I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors. Um, on the back of your program, there, there they are. Uh, with their support, we were able to make this as affordable as possible, uh, especially compared to the, you know, the cost of presenting it versus the cost of attending it. Uh, that, that became affordable thanks to our sponsors. So uh, I'd like to recognize the city of Nanaimo, the Partnership for Water Sustainability in BC, the Regional District of Nanaimo, Timber West, Island Timberlands, Green Rock Liquor Store, Hoskins Scientific, Tectonica Management, Chatwin Engineering, Lanark Consultants, Vancouver Island University, and Operaparian Environmental Consulting. Our planning committee is made up of representatives from the Partnership for Water Sustainability, uh, John Finney, Peter Law, Derek Richmond, and Kim Stevens. Rob Lawrence from the City of Nanaimo, Julie Pisani from the Regional District of Nanaimo, Wally Wells with Asset Management BC and the Nanaimo and Area Land Trust, and me, also with NALT. I'd also like to uh, send some appreciation to the Coast Bastion staff, uh, to Amanda Gingrass in particular for being so helpful with the uh, shifting sands of our requirements. And I'd also like to thank Steve. I don't know Steve's last name, but like Madonna and Prince, he's been a rock star for us. So <laughs> I uh, thank you very much. Well, good morning, everyone. How are you? Great. It's been a, it's been a long time since someone's called me Mr. Bose. <laughs> yeah, well, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely ecstatic to be here today. Uh, just really enjoyed to see the room full. I can feel the energy and we're gonna have a great day. Um, a little bit about me. I made a decision a long time ago to work on behalf of my community, to work where I live, where I play, because of my interest in working towards a better place, right? So I'm gonna bring a little bit of that perspective today and um, I'm hoping we can all share that perspective. How many were here in, last night and heard, heard Bob talk? Okay, about half the room. Bob talked about the hard work of hope. I'm gonna kind of elaborate a little bit on that theme throughout the day, and I'm gonna talk more about, you know, the, what, is, what is hard work? For me, there's a lot of hard work. There's hard work every day on behalf of my community to try to make things better. But it's good work. It's hard, but it's good. It's rewarding. You feel good about doing it. And we all go through these challenges in our daily lives with facing hard work and all of that. But the other thing that Bob mentioned is, is the hard work is better, easier, and more fun if we coalesce find other people to share the burden with us because then the joy is that much greater, right? So that's about it, my background. Um, first, uh, engineers in the room. Put your hands up, engineers. Uh, biologists. Uh, community stewards. There we go. How many geologists? What, that's a first. <laughs> so Norm, you and I, we're going to have to watch each other's back a little bit, right? <laughs> it is unusual to find a geoscientist mixing it up with the, the fish people, the pipe, the pipe people. But I actually think it's the best of both worlds, right? We know a little bit about rocks, dirt, flow. We know a little bit about fish, so we can kind of we can kind of BS the other two into thinking we know what we're doing, right? <laughs> we can get things done that way. Okay, I'm going to introduce our first two speakers today. Um, the first speaker, I put a post out last night that basically says, words 
can't explain how good it is to see my mentor here today with us. Every group, every community steward group, every project, every team needs what we call the sheepdog. The sheepdog is that person who just runs around the edges, never tires, always happy, yips and snipes, and, but in a friendly way, keeps, keeps the herd on track, moving towards your goal with the destiny in mind, right? It's critical. You look at all high-performing sports teams, work groups, community groups, there's always this person around. Kim Stevens is this person for the partnership. He's this person for me. And we're, we're really thrilled and lucky to have Kim here to give our uh, keynote address. Kim has been a water resource engineer for probably well over 30 years. I met him through my work, how long ago? 15, 20 years? I think it's about 20 years ago, yeah. So 20 years, Kim and I have shared this vision around the hard work, sharing it, and trying to make things better, right? So Kim's gonna give our keynote address this morning. We're just really happy to have you here. Absolutely. So right after Kim, we're gonna hear from another person that's quite special to me because this person and myself have literally shared my entire 25 year career at the District of North Vancouver. Zoanne Morton is gonna come up after Kim and she's gonna talk about her experience with Streamkeeper groups, her work with the Pacific Streamkeeper Federation, and we're going to hear of Zoanne's experience in bringing community groups from active day trip outings where a few people go to the local stream and learn about life in this stream to where she's brought the North Shore Stream Keepers group to the where they are actually, this year we struck a partnership with the group where they're actively collecting detailed water quality sampling data that the municipality is using for our integrated watershed monitoring plans. So that's the level of growth that Zoanne's been able to achieve with these local community groups. So we're really lucky to have her here, especially when I see how much of the audience is connected to the community through stewardship. So we're really lucky to have Zoanne Morton here on behalf of the Streamkeeper groups, the Streamkeeper Federation, We've worked together 25 years on different projects involving the North Shore watersheds. So, Zoanne, thanks for making the trip over. Looking really forward to hearing what you have to say. So, without further ado, Kim Stevens. Thank you, Richard. And now I know my nickname is going to be the Sheepdog, is it? <laughs> Just before I launch into what I'm going to say, I'm, I'm looking across and I see David Staffley of the Comox Valley and I, I need to kind of bridge in now with a bit of a story because it was a year ago in March when the, uh, when the Comox Valley stewardship sector initiated what was, became known, well it was called the Comox Valley Eco Asset uh, um, Symposium, right? And, and so, uh, you know, Paul mentioned Wally Wells and so the next day, um, Wally Wells came back to Nanaimo and he sent me an email saying, Kim, yesterday was great. We got to do the same thing in the Nanaimo region. And, and that was really the genesis of, of today. And, and of course, I responded immediately by saying, right, but you realize it'll take 12 months to make it happen. And that set off the process. And so um, what I want to mention that was for is because from the partnership's point of view, at the beginning of last year, we made a commitment to really put energy into our collaboration with the stewardship sector, because most of what we do is related to building capacity in local government. And so um, it's been a very successful year. And so one of the outcomes of this whole process today is the collaboration between NALT and the Partnership for Water Sustainability. And of course, our relationship with the Comox Valley stewardship sector. And it's a question of where will we all go together, building on the momentum that you started to get going a year ago and what we believe today will help create as well as a, as a launch. Enough of that transition, but I want to now 
in terms of, um, and I have to do this left-handed, um, reflecting on Bob's presentation last night, and really what Bob said, um, it was the call to action. And so what Bob does so well, because he's such a master at, at, at translating the, the high level, the global stuff, is setting the context, right? So that those on the ground, and we're all on the ground, will know what we all need to do to, over time, make a difference. And so, you know, in terms of, of our new reality of, of flood and droughts and, you know, the sponge communities, well, you know, you can think of it maybe being pessimistic, but really, you know, what we're saying is if we understand what causes the floods and droughts, over time we can build a water resilient future. So really the message here today, again, it's a message of hope, and as Richard has said and as Bob has said, it's the hard work of hope. And it does start on the ground. I wanted to use this kind of quotable quote to lead in because, you know, um, the Chinese have really captured global attention with their concept of sponge cities, which was really, really quite a simple concept if you understand the significance of soil. And I think what's become even more significant in terms of, of recognizing what's happening in China, well, first of all, I think people have to recognize that the only reason that they've really embraced the notion of sponge cities is because in the last decade with the rapid urbanization, they have created so many problems, right? So this is a reaction to the problems they've got uh, with floods and droughts. But you know what's always intriguing is in terms of major initiatives is if there's a guy at the top or a lady, you know, in, you know, in terms of if you think back to some of the uh, uh, female leaders in the world, if the person at the top gets behind the idea, it makes a heck of a lot of a difference. And in this case, President Z is the guy who was the advocate for the champion. So I suppose, you know, in terms of him now being ruler for life, <laughs> There, we can assume there's a long-term commitment to sponge cities. And you know, not only do they have the sponge cities, but they also have the vertical forests in China, which is an idea they got from an Italian architect who builds forests on the side of skyscrapers. So again, there's a, a lot of good stuff coming out of there. But the, the message for people in British Columbia is they've had to go this way because they messed things up. We still have a chance because we've preserved so much stuff. So we don't need to mess it up to have to do what they have to do to fix things up. And it's not just in China, you know, whether it's, it's Berlin, Berlin, it's got, a, it's got their sponge city, you've got Philadelphia are now seven years into their 25 year uh, you know, Green City Clean Waters program where they've really embraced the notion of restoring the sponge, right? Bring, restoring the, you know, the soil layer. So there's lots of examples now taking shape around the world where people are trying to make a difference but we're a little different in British Columbia in terms of what's motivated us, because we're motivated by the salmon. I will elaborate in a moment. Little did I know that uh, when I picked this quotable quote, it would tie in nicely with one of the questions to Bob last night, because I think the, sig the significance of, of Bob Sanford and Bob Sanford being so willing when we give him a call saying, Bob, we're going to do an event in Kelowna. Bob, we're going to do an event in and Courtney, we're gonna, Bob, we're going to do an event in Nanaimo that Bob, you know, with all his global commitments will say, what's the date? I'll be there. Because it's all about planting the seeds, right? So unless you, unless you plant the seeds, and as, as Morgan Guerin said, you know, unless you, unless you keep saying things enough times, well, if you say things enough times, it will happen. So that's, that's the significance of, of the Morgan Guerin quote. And just, Bob, to pick up on one of your comments last night, um, you know, in terms of First Nations in, in British Columbia, it, it is quite incredible when you take the time to spend time, uh, how much wisdom you can get from the Morgan Garrens and other people because they have thought a lot about the land and our relationship. And so we just need to open our minds. So in terms of my presentation, you know, it's broken into these three parts. And, you know, we're, we're just trying to see the conversation because we believe the stewardship sector is the key to what happens in the coming years and coming generations. And so in terms of the ideas that I want to plant, well, my mind map is, you know, what, so what, now what? And, you know, what is the issue? And as, as you heard Bob talk about last night, you know, the issue really is the natural water balance is out of balance. So it's out of balance on a global scale. It's out of balance on a, on a, on a local scale, let alone with the things that are going on globally. So what will we do? Um, well, say value watersheds as infrastructure assets. And the reason we're using that language 
because it's language that kind of local government uh, leaders can understand because it's an ill asset. And doing it right restored the water balance. So uh, the now what the phrase we were embracing, uh, coined by uh, Storm Cunningham almost 20 years ago, was restorative development. Picking up what Bob said, it is possible, right? We mess things up one property at a time. We can restore things one property at a time. It all depends on your, on your hot time horizon. So, in terms of uh, you know the uh, where we're at now, and I'm providing this from my perspective as an engineer whose career has been in the world of local government. And thank you, Richard, for saying it's only been 30 years. <laughs> Kind of dropped a decade or two there, didn't you? <laughs> but you know, because when you've been around as long as I have, you kind of remember why we did things. And and you know, one of the examples that I often give is I remember in 1980 as a young as a young engineer when the Ministry of Municipal Affairs had the bright idea of having standardized uh, subdivision control bylaws and a standard set of specifications and drawings which municipalities were embracing. So. In the early years of my career, I played a part in creating those, some of those, 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 those documents where we just basically blindly adopted things. And then you have to keep in context, the 80s was the, was the dead decade, right? That's when the, when the economy collapsed. So it wasn't until the 90s that we began to see the consequences of what we put in place in 1982. And for me, it always came down to, um, you know, the aha moment was in the city of Grand Forks, which never had drainage problems until I did a drainage study, <laughs> right? Uh, because, because when subdivision, when local governments throughout the province started really uh, implementing what really were city of Surrey standards, you know, the curb and gutter and all that kind of stuff, and all of a sudden we had problems. <laughs> and it was like, I think we made a mistake, right? It was, that was the kind of the aha. But it, so really, for a lot of us, it's kind of rectifying mistakes that we made in our careers 30 years ago. And so a lot of what you know, the stewardship sector sees as a problem today, it's the legacy of the community planning and infrastructure servicing practices that we put in place. Actually, not the idiots, 40 years ago, right? Almost 40 years ago. And so what that did on the, on the micro scale was we disturbed the natural water balance of watersheds because you know creeks go dry. Uh, when, it, when it rains, they, you have flash flooding. And then now you overlay that with the global context of what's happening with the Pineapple Express and 7% you know, more volume per one degree of, of rise. So that's the history of my career. And then down there, tucked in the, in the lower right-hand corner is, well, why are things turning, beginning to turn around now? Well, it's the financial and the level of service and the life cycle impacts and implications, those are the drivers for local government action. So it's really great that in the audience today, for example, we have Emmanuel Machado, the CAO of the town of Gibsons, because Manny, that's the issue, isn't it, right? The, the highfalutin words just didn't cut it, right? We could talk as much as we wanted about uh, you know, environmental goals and quality of life and all that kind of stuff, but at the end of the day, the only way we can communicate is dollars. And so at last in the last, Five years, basically, we've begun to reframe the discussion around language that the average person sitting around the council table on a Monday night can actually understand. Again, because I am an engineer, I want to share this perspective of my, one of my good buddies in the States, uh, Andy Reese, because he coined the term voodoo hydrology, and that's more than a decade ago. And he coined that term to explain the inadequate practices of the civil engineering profession. And I'm, Bob, again, I'm going to keep referring to you because I think about your comments last night when you said in the last 20 years, in terms of hydrology, we have learned more than in the entire history of the world. And, and that is so true because that's really what Andy was saying. A lot, of the, you know, a lot of the formulas that we learned were empirical from 1898, and maybe we've kind of glossied them up with really slick interfaces over the years, and you know, in terms of computer technology. But if you strip away all the, all the, all the, all the, you know, the front end, so to speak, the formulas aren't that great. <laughs> and that was really, that's really the essence of why uh, Andy, uh, who, who's written a textbook, but also does these annual webinar series on voodoo hydrology, 
hydrology just to open up the minds of, of the engineering profession about understand what, what these formulas really mean. You know, in terms of, you know, uh, as Annie and I guess it's actually Tom Debo who co-authored the, uh, the textbook with him out of the uh, University of Georgia who said, you know, basically, you know, uh, nobody can ever prove you wrong in engineering and drainage uh, because you can get any answer you want based on what assumptions you make. So it's important that the stewardship sector understand this context for what we as the engineering profession have been doing and has st are still doing in terms of how we approach a lot of things. And you know, this is an important image because it really captures where we as a profession have gone off track in the last 30, 40 years with, the, with those standards because the, in terms of drainage engineering, the focus is always on surface runoff, but surface runoff is only one of three flow paths. And so what is not understood even by the you know, my fellow engineers is the fact that there are three, three water balance pathways, each with a different time scale. You know, the, the surface runoff, yeah, that's rapid. The interflow, uh, which, which is, you know, that shallow horizontal flow, that's where most of the flow goes in British Columbia. You know, that's from days to seasons, and then of course you got the deep groundwater. And I think so often people think of groundwater as, just, as this under, you know, underground lake, not really, and our geologist is nodding her head, right? Because, you know, it's, it's still movement, movement of water, isn't it? Just at a different rate. And so if, you, if you're not taking into account that there's these three systems in play, each with a different time scale, which is complex, right? <laughs> and it's, it's too complex to get your mind around sometimes. That's kind of the root cause of why our practices got off track because all our energy has gone into one of three pathways. Why is that significant? Well, look at the numbers. <laughs> and and what, this, what this table shows you is across the continent, the significance of looking at the annual water balance and why it's important to understand the proportion of flow that goes by each pathway. And so, you know, when you look at coastal BC on, on, on the left-hand, uh, most left-hand column, and again, this on an annual basis, this is this is looking at these are real numbers, right? It, it's it's you can you know the rainfall that falls and what you can measure. And so, from gauged watersheds, when you consider that of the three pathways, surface is 10 percent, and that think about that because in British Columbia, what what. What underlies most of the, of the subsurface layers? Rock, right? Or glacial till. Um, aquifer, well, we don't have that many aquifers, aquifers other than the Fraser Valley, you know, when you got in the, in, in, you know, in the Grand Forks area and a few other places, but, you know, 10%. 60% is interflow. So just think of that number. Of the total volume of water that falls in a year, 60% of that volume is being managed by this surface layer of soil in the top one meter. And that's the, that's, that's the pathway, that's the layer that we have for 50 years have trashed in terms of our development practices. So is there any wonder that we've, that we've gone from a, to an unbalanced situation, you know, where we have more water to manage, you know, it's coming off faster. And this realization just didn't hit us until, until 2002 when we did the guidebook. And I'll, come, uh, I'll elaborate on that next. So that's the significance that historically the community development and infrastructure servicing process has overlooked, ignored, or eliminated interflow. And interflow was a word that, or a concept that people actually understood four or five hundred years ago. I'm looking, looking around and I saw, saw Dave, uh, Dave Reed here, and it was Dave Reed about well, almost 20 years ago that actually found a reference to uh, to a guy named Bernard Palissy in France, who in the 1400s or 1490, around that era, actually was the first person to grasp the concept of interflow. So it's not like it's a new concept. We kind of know these things, and then we forget. And that's our history. What happens on the land does matter. And as a water guy, it's always a frustration over the years to realize that people treat water and land as silos. And, and I think for um, one, of, one of my uh, memorable moments was through the, for the, um, the Water Sustainability Act um, process, 
leading up to the act was a 10 year process and I was on the technical advisory group and I remember the, the, the day where, where the, the group finally got it that you know, in terms of the Water Sustainability Act, we needed to um, reference the fact that it's land and water, stupid. <laughs> and so that's why one of the seven, seven goals of the, of, the, of the Water Sustainability Act recognizes that relationship between land and water because it's not something that's intuitively obvious. And for some reason, people have not necessarily gotten it that your land ethic is what drives what happens in the water. Not your water ethic, it's your land ethic. So again, from the from the you know the new normal as we've seen, especially the last few years about uh, you know floods and droughts, and you know in terms of, of uh, you know the the, uh, the longer drier summers, the warmer wetter winters, you know when when I reflect on what I learned in hydrology in the 70s, and 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 my operating assumptions through most of my career and how, how all those assumptions have been turned upside down in the last few years because you know in, in university uh, we thought like a five month uh, rain free period in British Columbia yeah we'll do the analysis for that but it never happens and you know and, and now we're, we're pushing that five and six month uh, duration as the new norm and with our small puddles of water which are our reservoirs we can't make it uh, through those through the six month drought unless we're really water conservation conscious. So this is, so in terms of the role of the partnership for water sustainability, well, we're looking at the water balance, the water cycle with fresh eyes. We are developing new approaches, uh, methodologies, and tools that would enable communities to achieve what we're branding as sustainable watershed systems through asset management. And it's too bad Wally's on that boat heading for Hawaii today because he's Mr. An Mr. Asset Management BC, but. Asset management is the way we, we're driving, beginning to drive change, beginning to drive change in, in British, British Columbia. And in terms of, uh, just as a postscript to that one, we only had about 50 copies to hand out, so I guess some of you have got the uh, water balance approach on, on Vancouver Island, so hopefully that will be a little bit more meaningful to you now when you flip the pages and see some of those numbers. And you're always nodding, so I guess you're getting it, right? <laughs> um, so. What will we do? Value creek, creek sheds. And I've started to use the word creek shed as a result of Finn Donnelly, member of parliament, in terms of him, him uh, saying we've got to start changing our language and, and make that distinction between the big watersheds and the small watersheds, which are really creek sheds. And uh, unless we start getting, unless we plant ideas and start using them, the terminology it won't become common practice. So creek sheds, right? Uh, as infrastructure assets and restore the water balance. That's the second idea. You know, nothing happens overnight. And I can tell you from experience that it has, you know, it took more than a decade to implement a policy program and regulatory framework that now makes what we're calling water resilient communities possible. And, and you know, 2003 was a very significant year in British Columbia. It was the teachable year. If I was to go around the audience and ask, why was 2003 significant? You'd probably all look at me blankly, but what if I said Kelowna, yeah. <laughs> right? Because if you think back what happened in 2003, I mean, we had, we started with the drought, the forest fires, Kelowna was, you know, they were evacuating a third of the town, uh, followed by floods. Pine beetle burst into prominence that year, right? So it was like the four horsemen of the apocalypse in, in 2003. That made it possible for us to do the Water Sustainability Action Plan for British Columbia. Because Gordon Campbell got it, right? And, 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 and timing is everything. And so, you know, everything, the reason I'm here today was because of the teachable year. When I've had the opportunity to go to different places like Australia, uh, uh, Vermont a couple of years ago when, when Senator Patrick Leahy invited me to come down there and, and do a presentation at his symposium. Um, my aha in Vermont was realizing the only reason we got the, in British Columbia, that we got the jump on so many regions of the world was because our teachable year came earlier than them. That in 2003 we had the teachable year in Vermont, their teachable year was 2010, where they got hit by a typhoon and all kinds of floods, and everything, you know, went, everything went to hell, so to speak, that year, and it kind of woke them up. And so, we, you know, that, but that's been significant, that we got the early jump in terms of our mindset. But that was just a teachable year. 
so really the, the, the next thing was the call to action, which was in 2008. And the reason it's the call to action because two things happened. Uh, because Gordon Campbell got it on water, and having talked, we know that, um, you know, living, living uh, water smart. You know, because everything we were doing between 2003 and 2008 was informing what was going into, into living water smart. And so that became the policy direction the same time as, as Campbell, uh, when he went and made his speech to UBCM, and he had a post-it note which was said, Green Communities. And when he announced the program, he then gave the post-it note to Glenn Brown and others in the Ministry of Municipal Affairs at the time and said, make it happen. <laughs> so, I mean, that's the significance. And really, then it took from 2008 to 2014, then, to get these three game changers. And that's the significance of, you know, the Water Sustainability Act, which was enacted in 2014. Developed with CARE 2014, which has not gotten the recognition and the profile that it needs. And part of that is because the people who are driving it retired. And nobody's picked up the ball. But in, 20, in 2014, we said, this is important. But what was, what, what was also important was in it ended, well, it was December of 20, uh, 2014 was uh, the release of, the, of Asset Management for Sustainable Service Delivery, a framework for British Columbia. Those are what we call the three game changers because it took a decade to get to that point where, th where th everything's in place that we need to make the change, but we just need to make the change. But of the three, the BC framework is the linchpin because the BC framework goes to the heart of what local government does, which is money, right? And so that's what, you know, and again, the, through the leadership of people like, like Glenn Brown, who's now went from the province to UBCM, and you've got people like uh, Liam Edwards, and, uh, who's, a, who's an executive director in, well, they're back to being called municipal affairs again, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, that's right. After all those name changes, and, and Brian Bedford, you know, the people who are driving the asset management uh, framework, you know, to, in, order to, in, order to, in order to get the grants now, local governments have to commit to the asset management process. And the emphasis is not on the asset management. The emphasis is on the sustainable service delivery, recognizing that's what gar local governments do, deliver services. So the financial incentive is in place to make the change. And so people like ourselves and, and Emmanuel Machado of, of Gibson's are driving the, the, the initiatives that are demonstrating how to push sustainable service delivery to the next evolution, which is how we manage the water the watersheds. But I just want to kind of step back for a second and kind of give you a, um, a bit of context because my personal legacy is the guidebook, the story of planning for British Columbia. Um, because you know that's that was really the, the um, that's when things began to change in terms of or gave us gave us the foundation document uh, that we had built on. And you know David reads in the room and he'll you know, remember probably the the um, when we had the meetings with the steering committee, and it came a point near towards the end, as the guidebook was about to be released, and we said, "What what is going to be our soundbite? How are we going to brand this?" And you got to think in terms of 2002 when we said our premise was going to be land development and watershed protection can be compatible. Can be compatible. In 2002, that was a radical, heretical statement to make because in 2002, we finally began to understand the, the basics, the causes. You know, and you know, in terms of, of terms of kind of reflecting on the significance is that when I was in Australia to do a keynote at a national conference in August of 2016, as I listened to the, the discussions that they were having in Australia, I realized our lucky break in, in, in British Columbia and in Washington State was that when Hor Rich Horner and Chris May did their their, their, their research. Research, Puget Sound research, research in the 90s, that we changed the conversation in British Columbia to be talking about fish and what, what's the cause of the, of, the, of the changes in the land that are, that are impacting on fish. Because in Australia in 2018, they're still debating engineering formulas as opposed to dealing with the root cause. And even though Rich Horner and Chris May are engineers, they understood the biology. And that changed the, the fact that we changed the conversation 20 years ago in British Columbia and put the focus on land use, changes, impacts. Let's go back to the source. What do we need to change on the land? And that got us thinking about the water balance and hydrology. So um, it's a foundation piece in terms of what we do. We continue to build on it. And again, to reiterate, 
the breakthrough was the science-based understanding. And that was huge in 1998, 1997, when Rich Horn and Chris May released their Puget Sound findings. And that's what began to allow us to bridge the gap between policy and site design. This is not as complicated as it looks. I was trying to capture a way to express my career and pick up an actually a point of yours, Bob, about what's taking so long. Because, you know, in 2002, we had the big breakthrough and understanding cause and effect. But in retrospect, I can see that that was actually the easy part. The easy part was to understand, you know, how we get from science some based understanding of changes in hydrology to, or rather from policy to, to infrastructure and site servicing practices. We began to understand the changes in hydrology and what this meant. In 2018, you, know, you say 16 years, after 16 years, you, you would have thought we'd have it all implemented, right? The, the change would be standard practice. But it's the devil is in the details. It's those subdivision control bylaws that are based on 1950s, 1960s thinking that's the bane of our life, right? Because everybody can buy into the high level language and, and, and understand the basic concepts, but unless you change the way the design engineer is doing things on the ground, you haven't changed anything. And, and that's, that's the grinding process that we're into. And, and that's the disconnect between knowing what you should be doing, and most people know what they should be doing versus actually doing it. So it's not that we don't know, it's just we're not doing it, and we're not doing it fast enough. And just to go back, yeah, it's that entrenched beliefs and just that reluctance to change, right? It's as simple as that. And, you know, as I, as I reflect on, 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 you know, that 16 year time frame, and, our, and my own role in terms of, of, of on the, on implementing the action plan and doing what I do, that you know, in the early years, and Richard remember this, when we did a water balance training workshop, people knew they needed to be there because the provincial government was behind us. And then in 2008, you know, the economy cra crashed. By 2009, I mean, Gordon Campbell, he still got it because in 2009 we got the premier's award. But then, you know, if you think of since 2009, uh, the lack of <coughs> high-level support, you know, used to be if I wanted to go to an event and say, I'm so-and-so in the provincial government, I need you to be there with me to, to, to show the provincial flag. We need to be able to tell this message. It became harder and harder in the last few years because people couldn't leave Victoria because there's no travel budgets. So you have to wonder about the, you know, the significance, the importance of having people who work for the province be the ones to say things, not me be the ones to say, well, if you talk to Glenn Brown or Lynn Fry Wilkin or so-and-so or so-and-so, this is what they'll tell you. It's not the same. So another busy slide, but in terms of a storyboard, in terms of, 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 of there's a lot of information that kind of tells the story. So 2015, we released Beyond the Guidebook 2015. We've kept that way of thinking, you know, it's the guidebook, we go beyond the guidebook, to, beyond the guidebook 2007, beyond the guidebook 2010. Our educational goal, that those who are involved in municipal land use and drainage would understand the vision for sustainable watershed systems through asset management. It's an educational goal, right? Part of that's the paradigm shift to recognize watersheds as infrastructure assets. And the significance there is people in local government get it in terms of, you know, the, the, uh, whether, whether you use the word liability or deficit, that we don't have the money to refinance or replace our existing core infrastructure like water and sewer and roads. And so the simple challenge to a council or board or uh, a regional board is, why would you take on another unfunded liability called drainage, which is what you've been doing for a lifetime? And so, but if you begin to think of that watershed as an asset which you have to manage as you would any of your other assets, it changes the way you think. So the watershed is a system, it's an integrated system. The three pathways, you gotta think of those, each of those pathways as your, each is an infrastructure asset. Each of those pathways provides a water balance service. Core concepts. This is where we're at right now in terms of through the BC framework, uh, moving along a continuum. It's a journey again because even in terms of asset management slash sustainable service delivery for local government, they're still having to make that, you know, some are, some are at ground zero, 
Some are maybe starting step one. The really advanced ones may be a step two. So you can't expect people to go from ground zero in terms of how they manage their assets to going to step three, which is applying you know, the ecological accounting process uh, to creek sheds to manage watersheds from a life cycle point of view to realize that you know, things have cost implications. So, but as understanding grows, we can expect local governments to incrementally move along the continuum. I should have mentioned earlier this logo is the branding logo for the BC framework. So you can look at that as being a continuum. You can look at the steps one, two, and three being the continuum, but that's a key image. All these PowerPoint presentations will be on the uh, waterbucket.ca website, so you can get it there. In the finale few minutes, now what? Key message. Restorative development is possible. It's one property at a time, right? So again, if we mess it up at one property at a time, we're gonna have to fix it up one property at a time. I think to echo what you said, Bob, <laughs> we don't have the luxury of time, right? We don't have the luxury of time. We fritted that away, you know? The, the last 16 years, in my view, in terms of what I do, has been characterized by, yes, we've made great progress, things are getting better, but boy, the missed opportunities have been incredible. It's the missed opportunities that <coughs> result in the cumulative benefits rather than the cumulative impacts. Whoop. Went too fast. Literally, the eyes of the world are, are, are on this group today. And the reason I say this is because Storm Cunningham you know, he coined the term restorative development in, in, in his 2002 book, The Restoration Economy. Well, last week, Storm Cunningham reached out to me, got hold of me, because he became aware of this event today and was intrigued by it, right? And on Tuesday, uh, he tweeted his and, and used his LinkedIn account to communicate to his 40,000 followers around the world about what's happening in Nanaimo Wednesday and Thursday. Because what's going on is significant. I think it's what, echoing what you said last night, right, Bob? When people say, why are you going to Nanaimo? Because this is where things are happening, right? <laughs> but, you know, again, the guys walk the talk, and, 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 and uh, the point being that, you know, we have a lot of experience in a lot of areas of how to get things right. And I did, so when I interviewed uh, Storm, and for those of you who did read the, uh, our e-newsletter on Tuesday, you know, that key, those, uh, those quotable quotes came out of the interview with, with Storm. And I, so I asked him, well, what, what was your motivation? You know, where, where was the aha moment in your life? And, and uh, then it, he got talking, and then, and then, he, then he referred to Bill Rees. He said, well, who's that professor I met up in UBC, uh, the ecological footprint guy? Bill Rees. How do you know Bill, Bill, Bill Rees, right? And he said, but Bill, Bill Rees is kind of a doom and gloom guy. Because <laughs> with, with Bill, with Bill and I had him as a, pref as a professor, but, um, because you know, Bill, Bill, you know, only sees us, you know, consuming more and more resources, and the and the and the point that that Storm Cunningham made to Bill Reese was, you know, the flip side of the problem is the opportunity, and you know, when we do restoration work, you know, we're making things better. So it's not about just making things less worse; it's about making things more better, right? And that's and you know, you got to take into account the two the two parts of the equation, and that's really the significance of what Streamkeepers are doing, right? Making things better. So that's an important takeaway. Um, this afternoon, my colleague Tim Pringle will be talking about uh, or the ecological uh, accounting process, but it's all about getting people to look at watersheds differently, to get, about, get people to understand the whole system, uh, water balance view, and, and uh, begin to kind of reframe things so that those making the decisions kind of see things in terms of there's a cost to them if they don't get it right. So what can stream keepers do? That's why we're so happy that 75% of this crowd are stream keepers, because you need to be informed and educated in terms of, of the water balance approach. What is all, and how, you know, why, uh, why getting it right would reduce erosion and protect your creek? Because you need to have the right questions and the right information to go to your local members of council. And Barry Avis is an example, be from, from Qualicum Beach is here today, right Barry? I mean, it helps if, if, if somebody is informed and educated when they have the conversation with you to give you the ammunition that you need to be, make an informed argument at, at council. And expand your involvement and your, and your influence 
beyond the creek channel, right? Because unless, unless you restore the water balance in the watershed, you know, as, as Otto Langer, a famous figure in DFO lore said about 20 years ago, you just keep putting the sticks and stones in the creek bed and they keep being blown out because until, until, until you address the hydrology, the, the work you do in the creek is not long term. So, I just try to get you prepped because the heart of today's program is the town hall and the panel session. So, over this next hour while you're listening to then Zoanne and then the panel, think about how will communities get it right through collaboration as land develops and redevelops because today's theme is really is the collaboration between the stewardship sector and local government. That's the message. So reflect on that, reflect on your own experience, get yourself mentally prepared for the town hall. Whoop, sorry. Because I'm just gonna hand off to Zoanne Morton. I just wanted to say good morning and say, you know, I am Zoanne Morton, I'm the executive director of the Pacific Stream Keepers Federation, and I'm filling in for Gail. So some big foot, footprints and uh, footsteps to fill in for. And I uh, fell into a well-oiled machinery, this uh, group that has put on this workshop for you. I think it's been a year in the making, and it certainly shows. So hopefully my last minute additions will be uh, ones that are awesome. So after listening to Bob and Kim, I found myself simultaneously depressed and uplifted. A little depressed at the situation of the world that the world is in, and at the same time uplifted that at least we know a bit about our past, where we are now, and maybe a little bit about where we need to go to improve our fate. But most of all, I'm uplifted because of you. Yeah, all of you. Because of the power of the people, you care so others care. Starting in our home spaces and then stretching out into community, nationally, and for some of you even internationally, you have helped encourage people to change, to look around them and get curious as to the natural world and what she has to offer. Kim spoke to the coho crisis in the 1990s and the shift in thinking at that time. While my talk is to be on the history of stewardship, I kind of needed a starting point, so I've chosen that same time frame. But let's go back for a moment to you. You as an individual and you as a collective. It's my firm belief that government cares about fish and fish habitat because you care about fish and fish habitat. And you do so in quite a vocal way. And these days, you know, you don't do it in the chicken little kind of way. You do it with a balanced approach. You do it with balanced people, balanced thinkers, and people with great experience. We now come from a place where we have the educational, science-based understanding of our environment, of our watersheds, and how we support the life that is struggling to survive within them. So let's go back to the 1990s, back to the coho crisis. We've just come off a time when the environment was under the care of the government, their workers, their funds, their policies, but this has all begun to diminish. The stewardship communities were in the picture already and had been working on local issues beside government personnel. Now, here comes the reduction in staff and the coho crisis and budget cuts for all levels of government departments. Yikes. But this is where you all begin to shine. This is when the spotlight was put on to stewardship. New programming comes into effect. New B-based funds come to availability for us all, for non-government people. So many new acronyms, so many new initials. It was really like a new language we had to learn. Over the next few years, we were introduced to FRIMP and FRAP, PSKF, HRSAP, the Salmon Enhancement Program, the Pacific Salmon Endowment Fund, HCTF, Fisheries Renewal, Forest Renewal, HCSP, USP, <laughs> Habitat Stewardship Program, and those are just the ones that I've remembered right away. Okay, so funding opportunities like the Pacific Salmon Foundation now has more money to go out as grants to you folks. A multitude of businesses and banking establishments offered grants as well. And many of these programs that came out were kind of hybrids. Programming came with people, a mandate, and grant dollars. 
Programs like the Habitat Conservation and Stewardship Program with Department of Fisheries and Oceans were well thought out programs with wide reaching effects as they had staff components that included stewardship coordinators. I think you'll remember Jennifer in the middle there. She's now working with the Comox Valley Watershed and beyond. And these uh, habitat stewardship coordinators worked with the local volunteers. We had habitat auxiliaries, their trained personnel who worked mainly with Department of Fisheries and Oceans, and habitat stewards to work with the local level of government. So really, a really well thought out program. And these new employees worked together towards common goals. Those were the days. Each of these programs came and most of them have now gone. It's referred to as a sunset programming. Typically they have a five year window and in that time they have to get up and running, they need to run and they need to close down. So the programs themselves are often short lived but their legacies live on. As I was looking at a few reports to try and refresh my memory on the past programming, I came upon one that reflected on the demise of these programs and of the doom and gloom when the funds uh, disappeared around them. The report spoke of the partnerships disintegrating and a small local group being left holding the bag with lots of issues facing them in the watershed and no money and how it would be only a matter of time before this tiny group would burn out and they too would move along. This report was written in 2003 and the group they spoke of last year had a budget of almost a half a million dollars. They had over 200 regular volunteers who are dedicated to the local watersheds and all the events and they now have three full-time employees the tenacity of some people. So each program, even sunset programs, bring value. They spark interest, bring more knowledge to communities, educate another set of people, and after working with the program, many of the employees end up in local government positions, in agencies such as MOT, in the forest, mining, logging, and the oil and gas sectors. These people bring to these new positions their broader understanding of the ecosystems, biodiversity, the needs of the environment, and they bring us. We're in their heads and we're in their hearts. They know who they can come to to have a cup of coffee with, to chat with um, when a new proposal is being planned in the watershed nearby, to gain local knowledge of what's happening in our watersheds today. They know who to connect with to start a new working group and many from the NGO community, staff and volunteers alike have been asked to come and review and comment on items like the streamside protection regulations, new acts and regulations, local land use planning, diking proposals to combat the effects of climate change and the list is endless of where we have been asked to come in to participate. I often hear people say, we weren't consulted enough. You didn't take our concerns into consideration. Just the idea that the people, us commoners, have an expectation to be asked our opinion and to be listened to is truly amazing. People before us, and I'm going to add many of the people in this room, blazed the way for this to even be in the realm of possibility. It was the norm for government to set the acts, the rules, the regulations, guidelines, bylaws, all of it without asking us, the public, for our input. But this has changed. The new reality is that we expect and have the opportunity for input. The Fisheries Act was one of the acts recently opened to make changes to and the citizens were asked to provide input. I can't remember the final total, uh, total of the number of comments that were received. I do know it took a lot longer for them to go through them all than they imagined, but it was in the thousands. But I do recall that over 60% of that input came from British Columbia. Our stewardship past has put us in the right place to be able to have informed input. In 1988, when I was a young mom working part-time as a teen counselor, 
My children's community school, community advisor, asked if I would help out with the school salmonids in the classroom program. And I said, sure. I knew very little about water. I knew less about watersheds. I knew some people liked to eat salmon. I'm not counted amongst those people. <laughs> yeah. Who would have imagined that I could and would be taught not just to care about these things, but to bring myself to understand um, the needs and be asked to share about watersheds and their health, to be asked to join in the teams on the development of things like the Streamside Protection Regulations. Later to be asked to assist in the compilation and implementation of the DFO Streamkeepers Program. And most recently to be asked by the DFO Standing Committee on the Fisheries Act to come and to be a witness to the need to change the Fisheries Act and what indeed to change within it. <laughs> Who would have thought, eh? So the Stream Keepers program brought about the ability for regular people to learn about their streams, to use science-based protocols to map and monitor <laughs> their local waterways. And people took to the program like ducks to water. Soon groups were popping up across the Pacific region and the community was seeing firsthand of the changes in their watersheds. They were in awe of the creatures, typically hidden in the water or under rocks, coming now to know those creatures, who they were, and how to tell about the health of the streams by those who live within them. And they started to talk about streams and watersheds to their neighbors, friends, and family, and to the government of all levels. And it's fun to do, so more people joined. I'm reminded of my friend Bob. So Bob was a high school teacher, he was a math teacher, and one day while walking his dog, he saw a group of people in the little creek in his backyard, poking around and prodding in the stream bank and looking like they were expecting to see something. So he went and asked them who they were, and talked about what they were up to, why they were doing this, and he took their card. And he tucked it in the back of his head, and that day he said to himself, one day I'm gonna join that group. And nine years later, once he retired, Bob went back to the creek, found the group, and again they were out there poking and prodding and they were still there. And I think that's what the stewardship community is all about. We are still there when somebody is finally ready to join in. And then he began his own journey, learning about streams and the life within them. Bob counts for turning salmon, he counts the fry of the year and takes part in, in smolt enumeration. But he keeps a watchful eye on the stream on his daily walks with his new dog, the last one was older, and has now taken his passion for photography and will out on his walks on Tuesday morning at 10.45, he takes a photo of Lynn Creek off the Rusty Bridge. One shot upstream, one shot downstream. Same spot, same day, same time. For eight years now. With this time series, these photos are up online and you can see them by googling scenes from a rusty bridge, Morton Creek Sand Enhancement, and they've been used for restoration planning. These photos have been used to understand the green up process, when our trees are budding up, because it's happening at different times these days. They've used to study stream dynamics and hydrology. He's a math teacher. He ran into a group of community members, a longshoreman, a, co a count, a court, clerk, a parks interpreter, an ESL teacher, and a young biologist consultant gaining in-stream experience. And he said, one day, I'm going to do that. This scenario plays out every day across BC, and our numbers grow each day, as does the list of past professions. Take a look at the person next to you. They are here because they care. Not a little bit. They care a lot. They are here because they have witnessed firsthand what is happening in their watersheds and they have met others who care and they want to be a part of change. Our numbers include some rather phenomenal champions for the environment from what we might have considered unlikely backgrounds. We have people who were artists, teachers, firemen, pianists. I'm sure we even have a butcher, a baker, and a candlestick maker out there somewhere. But in the past 10 to 15 years, we have managed to attract a new type of volunteer, people who have retired from public service, from federal government, provincial agencies, and municipal planners. 
Take a look at the names and past work experience of the executive directors and CEOs of large NGOs like the Salmon Foundation, Nature Trust, BC Wildlife Federation, Living Rivers, etc. And we will see these people who have come out of government thought that working within community is a way to affect change. We as a whole are pretty amazing. We have diverse backgrounds, diverse knowledge sets, and a huge willingness to learn more and to share with others our new findings. In the day and age of sharing of information, it's never been so easy, and the desire for others to get this information um, is a high point as well. Like people actually are wanting more and more information, but you've got to remember to do it fast and in sound bites. As long as um, we're not too long in our reporting or newsletters or videos, but we use blogs, Facebook posts, and ample opportunity to get to the creek for hands-on works and interaction with nature, it's drawing more and more volunteers all the time. These days, we tend to target the newly retired. I spoke of these people before, and we need them for our groups. Retirees are younger these days, or they start out that way. <laughs> they have a wealth of knowledge. They want to be involved in their local communities. They want to stay active. They want to make friends. They want to learn new things. They want to give back to their communities. Each of us has our story of who we were, how we got hooked, what we're up to now because of the fact that we care, and each of us is a product of government programming. Each of us has helped make change, has helped pave the way for more people to join in with more people to be asked for their input and to have something worthwhile saying. For those of us who started out to save the world, well, that's a tough slog. And we, weren't, uh, we aren't there as yet, but we can take pride in being in a better uh, state than if we had stayed home and ate bonbons on the couch. Yesterday it was enlightening to be out at the farm and during a talk on carrot seed production and having farm and food programs for community, the leader spoke to pieces that we have all wrestled with. And we're going to wrestle with that more this afternoon. They talked about the development in the area and they talked about rain. He spoke of the water coming off the roofs and roadways and not having enough land left to uptake all the flows. Then there was talk of heavier, more prolonged rainfalls. Then there was talk of municipalities and how they've talked of swales, detention ponds, and a lot of innovative ideas that would be ideal to deal with this. Yet as we stood in the field and looked around, we heard a comment. Where are these swales? Where are the detention ponds? We seem to get the new builds, we seem to get the housing, but the natural in initiatives are at a time a wee bit slow on the uptake. The hard work of hope that we heard of last night, we have the pieces to do better to embrace a water first approach. The past programs I spoke of brought together people who combined their energies and produced amazing guidebooks, such as the stewardship series. If you haven't read these for a while, like let's say in the last 20 years, <laughs> or you didn't know that they existed, it would be worth your while, I think, to bring these up and revisit them. I don't recommend trying to phone any of the phone numbers in these things because they are outdated, but the principles hold true. There are many, many reports and recommendations on how to get it right in our watersheds out there. Federal and provincial agencies, municipalities, regional districts, the new version of the West Van Labs and many others are looking to work more closely with community volunteers and water projects. We, the local stewardship community, have volunteered in our watersheds for eons and we continue to monitor, to check the health of our streams and we have seen the changes over time and lately it doesn't seem to take a lot of time to see a lot of change. As many others have passed through, sometimes helping and other times hindering, we rely on the locals to continue to do what they do. And they do best at watching over and monitoring and documenting the day-to-day -day happenings of the stream because people need to know. And if you're not there, then it'll be hard to know what's happening today. Some members will take to being active on watershed roundtables, 
Some will join in on working groups for land use planning or changes to policy and regulations. Some members will remain to monitor the day-to-day, month-to-month happenings on the streams to inform those at those tables as to what is happening in the here and now and to take in those new recruits to show them the ropes. From past programming, we have protocols for monitoring and guidebooks and people in place to keep the next generation of stewards going. The next programming opportunities that we have, that's coming. And that's a part of why we're here today. Over the years, government started to work with communities, with First Nations, with municipalities and industry and business. We all struggled at first to learn to get to know one another to celebrate our shared successes and to figure out our responses in times of trouble. We have worked together on salmon enhancement, the augmentation of stocks and streams of need. I think I'm pushing something weird here. Um, we have monitored the stream's attributes and done remediation and restoration works. We have stood, um, uh, we, okay, we have monitored the stream attributes, we have compared our findings, we have stood by, side by side at public information forums, we've sat side by side at watershed roundtables, we've walked side by side along our streams, we've marveled at the sight of nature and grieved at the gravesite of newfound friends. And now we look to bring all that work together for our streams and our watersheds to bring our knowledge, our unique backgrounds and perspectives and see how we can incorporate all of this into today. We are still here. We've all been learning. We've all formed relationships. We have all have a pretty good idea of what our landscape is up against. We are all trying to find balance with new tools and new processes along with our continued interest in the watershed that we've lived in for so long, or in Vancouver Island, you're getting a lot of people from the mainland, but they have understanding of watersheds that they're bringing with them, just not yours. Please help them. And together, let's use the opportunities being presented here today to discuss how we can learn from the past, gain an understanding of tools to help guide new development and new processes for the future for streams, salmon, and stewards. I look forward to hearing today everyone's contributions throughout our time together and thank you for your time and attention this morning. Keeper Bob story. And this is a, a motivating story because Streamkeeper Bob, who I've known for my 25 years at the district, we would meet regularly. He would come to me one day and he said, Rich, I want to do more. What can I do? What are the issues? Well, we've got construction, we have sediment issues, we've got erosion control issues, and all of this. So, you know. Three, four hundred building permits a year, just me. I can't be everywhere all the time. Two weeks later, Streamkeeper Bob shows up at the counter and he says, You told me that building permit information was freedom of information. Absolutely, Bob. Well, how would I go about getting a list of the building permits? So I showed him how to go about doing that. I connected him with the person in our office. And then from then on, every week, Bob would come to the hall and he would get a list of the new building permits issued that past week. And he would go with his dog sometimes 
and wander around to every one of these sites. He put his own vest on, and he would just casually walk by, and he would look at things like catch basin protection. How is your filter doing in the catch basin in front of your job site? What does your driveway and your access path look like? Is it trailing dirt down the road? He would be friendly, introduce himself. Well, the only thing he would say is, hi, I'm Bob. I'm from the Stream Keepers. And he would have a conversation and a dialogue with these people. Word would get back. And so it was through people like Bob we began to collect information. We began to collect data. And it, I'd like to think that through Bob's efforts, we now have two more permanent staff whose main job and function is, is to check up on the building and construction community for things like erosion and sediment control. So that's how stewardship groups can have a direct influence in the area outside the ravine banks, right? So there's a story. I'm looking for someone who would like to tap into Zoan's experience and ask some questions about what you could do, what you might want to do. Any questions? Yes, here we come. Thank you, Joanne. Great presentation, very inspiring. Um, in the slides today, uh, Tim was talking about what things stewardship groups can do. And I had to say that I was uh, I was thinking exactly the same thing before that slide came on, and that is we need to spend, we still need to do our work in the streams. It's very important to do all our monitoring. But I think it's really important that stream keepers get out of the watershed and get in front of their community and do more education. The work that all the information is being um, developed through this or through the Partnership of Water Sustainability. So we have all the information, all the tools. <clears throat> I'm not as optimistic as, as um, Kim is about leaders at the top, you know, deciding for us what's going to be good. The only thing that's going to change things in this world is us getting involved, and pushing our local governments, educating our communities, and advocating. So I would like your your viewpoint on this role that stewardship groups tend not to take on, they tend to focus on their, their, which is very important work for all the reasons and all the stories we've heard today. Yeah. So one of the things that's important is to have your group grow and to have someone in your organization who that is kind of on their top of mind at all times. So they're not um, always focused on what's going on in the stream. So we have the people that are involved in the stream end of things. They're gonna learn what's happening today and be able to feed that up the, up the chain. And as somebody gets to a point of saying, okay, I've done this quite quite a bit, I know how it is, I've shared the experience, I've got some new friends, then they do on their own sometimes go and approach the municipal workers or approach somebody else and say, what is the next step? Where can I, I go to next? And it's important that someone in your group has it in their head what those next steps are. And when the person is actually at the point of being able to go there. Some people want to go to the next level just slightly before they should. <laughs> And so it's important that they are helped to be fed to go up to that next level. Speaking in front of council is like amazing. Those council members, they're just six people who were really popular that day, but they got voted <laughs> in, right? And they have probably more say over your day-to-day -day life and what's going on than any other group of people I know. So, so, but these people are, are there and you, you can go in front of the council or in front of regional district or wherever your processes are. We're told that you only get two to three minutes. That's your time frame and it's hard sometimes to get a point across in two to three minutes. So we went and talked to our mayor and we asked them how do we like extend this a bit without having to put in for a process of a formal application and waiting a year to get involved and whatnot. And he said, just have two of your members each do a three minute presentation back to back and then you've got six minutes to come and give us a little bit more of an educational end of things within their, that council members. Many of your groups and organizations have um, educational opportunities at uh, outings, inviting the community to come and see what you're doing. River Never Sleeps is coming up and that one's going to be a good educational component for the uh, local people to come to. And there's school uh, classroom programs if you're going to educate that way. There's lots of opportunity for education, but having someone in your organization 
who looks at the people and sees their skill sets and draws on those and gets those people interested, super important to have that one really dedicated to people in your group. So Anne, thank you for your presentation. It's pretty inspiring. Um, in Cumberland, we're facing a major development in the headwaters of five, seven bearing streams that's going to be happening within the next few years. Uh, the proponent has a great deal of financial resources. The village has limited resources. And the people in the community are really interested in holding the developers' feet to the fire, but we're not really resourced to be able to do that. And I was wondering if you had some suggestions. We're not necessarily looking for money, but for expertise to help us evaluate the environmental impact statements that are going on and the things that the developer is doing. Where do you look for resources to help you in that kind of uh, process? I'm really high tech. I go to Google in most cases, but you might want to look at the water bucket analysis and ask for some expertise from people from the water bucket who have that expertise in knowing, especially about those interflows and about the, the surface end of things. A lot of streams these days are going subsurface a little earlier than they used to. I try not to use the word dry because no one cares about a dry stream. So it just goes subsurface, just you and I can't see them. But there are some modeling um, effects out there, things that the people understand. But the main thing is, is to stay within what your group actually truly understands. If you are caught out talking about something that you really didn't know enough about, your credibility goes down quite quickly. So it's important to bring in people to your group who have that, that background and, and expertise. And you might want to even put something out through your community and just ask if someone's newly retired with that expertise that could come and speak one-on-one -on -one with you or maybe even be the face of that one project. Try to have a beginning, middle, and end to your project so that person doesn't feel hooked for life. But I mean, hook them for life, but you know, <laughs> just let them think that they're getting off. But try and bring in those people who have that experience and understanding. And don't let others fool you. I've gone to those meetings and they talk about, you know, we, I was talking about a stream that was running underground and the developer was talking about swales. And, and people were eating up this whole swale thing. And I said, no, it's not, nothing to do with swales. It's underground water. And then they said, oh, yeah, we have lots of opportunity. There's lots of things we can do. And I said, I'm well aware there's lots of things you can do. I see no initiatives that you're undertaking to do anything. So stay focused. When I ask a question, I write the question down in front of me, and then I hold my pen over it. And until I get an answer, I don't put a tick mark next to it, because they will talk around and around and around, but not give you an answer. So make sure you, make sure you get an answer to your question and bring in the big guns, bring in expertise for those moments in time that, that you need them. But the power of a person is quite amazing. And the power of a letter is even more amazing. Don't send emails. Does that help? Uh, thanks, Joanne. I, I was just going to mention, uh, I'm from local council, Quadrant Beach. And uh, I'm thinking of how to get people involved. But I joined the council in 2003. And then in 2005, the local street people, which was a, a little group, which is now a huge group, came to me and said, uh, you need some education. <laughs> and Dave Cross, who's going to speak later today, he good spent education. Uh, two days with a, a couple of people, a few people, and we learned some information. We also had some First Nations people there, which helped a bit about the history. So I think that is the ultimate in the sense that you can get the local government and pull uh, two or three people from the group to have that knowledge. So you don't have to do all the presentations. They can do the presentations for you and speak and promote, promote the ideas. So I'm just suggesting that uh, I don't know how we're doing that now, but back then, I used to have a little group came and said, uh, we've got an expert. You want to see what's happening in your creek. Maybe we need a program to do that, uh, approach all councils. I'm thinking of on the Vancouver Browning guy, but on all the Vancouver Browning, um, and now is the timing for that. This is an election year. You might not have heard about it yet, but it's coming in October. Your council members are going to want to get their photograph in the newspaper with uh, lovely um, leaders of community such as yourself. And it's a really good opportunity now to invite them out on that walk and talk and walk along the stream and let them experience for themselves. Don't always tell them everything. Let them, like, tell them something that will lead them to see it for themselves. And once you see something for yourself, I think it sticks in there a little bit longer. 
I know that with the West Vancouver String Keepers, they have a, a deal where they work with the local school and they do salmon surveys and they have about a hundred students that go out and do this in little um, breaks. So they needed an adult to go out with each of these sections of, of students. And they didn't have enough. So they actually turned to their council members and asked them to join up and go out with these students. And now they have every member of the West Vancouver String Keepers, or council is on the West Vancouver String Keepers. Pamela Goldsmith Jones was the mayor at the time. Um, she's now in our, the MP for the area and very much involved with the fisheries end of things. She has certainly taken the people with her in her heart and in her head and uh, carry that along. But this is the year. If you want to get into the idea of talking to councillors and, and getting them to understand watersheds and stuff, this year their ears are open. Please, talk into them. Hi, hi everyone. I'm over here. Okay. Thanks. Um, thank you for your presentation. I, um, I just became a local stream keeper on the cat stream in the south end of Nanaimo. And I also work uh, for Aboriginal early childhood research. And so we're trying to bring little ones um, between the ages of three and five to the stream um, and do some health assessments or like a junior stream keepers. What we're coming across um, in the streams in our, the south end of Nanaimo is a lot of homelessness and uh, needles that are being left under the bridges and in the areas where we want to bring the kids. And so there's sort of like an intersectionality happening around social issues, uh, issues of the environment, and then the vulnerability of both young Indigenous children and the vulnerability of our streams. And I'm wondering if you can speak to any, uh, any knowledge you have around the impacts of homelessness and I, what we see in our in our neighborhood is that tents are popping up more and more people are, like streams are a good place for people to hang out and to sleep overnight. And so while we're trying to bring children down to these areas, we're also, parents are afraid and administrators are afraid because they don't want their children to be brought in harm's way. So I feel there's a tension. Um, and I'm not sure if we should, we should deal with this at a government level or a community level or through, through education. Yes to all of those levels. It will take quite a bit. The, um, the uh, issues we have with the homeless people, I mean having people camping in our riparian areas that have been set aside for wildlife is not a solution to the homeless problem. That's, that's not the solution. Um, that problem though is, is throughout areas because it, in a, it is in an area that has uh, running water, sometimes a bit of a food source in the fall, <laughs> and, uh, and is easy um, areas to congregate in amongst trees because there's not a lot of, of tree areas. And with that though comes things like, like needles. Please don't take the three and five year olds until that issue is dealt with. And that is, a, <laughs> yeah, that's a, a health problem and so I'd go to the health authorities. We were doing a stream cleanup on McKay Creek one day and I went in and I did a bit of a cleanup and I came out and I said, well I just feel like Molly made. <laughs> I went in there and you know cleaned up all the garbage from this guy's house or home area and I said, do I leave the tent behind? Do I leave the sleeping bag behind? What, what do I do? I've cleaned up the mess but you know I, I didn't really appreciate it. And what the city of North Vancouver has done that I think is a really good example for others to do is they find that areas this happens and they bring someone down to assist. So they bring a social worker with them and they actually do a care for the person at the same time as an evacuation of the area. Because people breed people. That's just how it is, garbage breeds garbage. And so people come, uh, oh, sorry, that sounded awful for a moment. I don't mean that the people are garbage. I just mean that if you see a bit of garbage somewhere, pick it up because it's gonna breed more and more people will dump there. And the same as when somebody sets up a, a camp or a seal comes into your area, these things kind of build on, on one another. But it's not up to us to go in there and, and talk to the people and ask them to, to go. This is something that needs to be done by the authorities. But when I found out that they went in with the um, kind of municipal workers to take things out and brought a social worker and brought them in contact with a lot of the agencies that we have that have now moved down into that McKay Creek corridor to be there to give a, a helping hand up. Um, those people have worked together really well and now it's gotten to a point where we can go in safely 
into most areas. We have a couple of areas, and to be honest, we just don't go there because it's not it's not safe to go. Thanks, Joanne. Very tough question. Uh, I'm going to make a suggestion that you start with the local government. We in North Van, like Joanne mentioned, we've established a, a protocol so that we have an, a phone call number sheet and we do a bit of training for any volunteer groups that are wanting to come in and do stewardship activity in certain watersheds. So there's a number to call um, and that number does go to our social outreach program. And then we have a, another number and we track places where we find sharks and things like that. We, the city, will come and responsibly dispose of this material if it's found and all. So there's a little training around handling procedures, safety protocols and things like that. That can start at your local government. So we're right on time and we're gonna break for coffee, but I wanted to just share another little story around a question I think from here around how do we bring science and knowledge to the, the local stream keeper groups to help them advocate for watershed health? So it's again, uh, I mentioned this citizen science project that we're working on. <coughs> this has become possible because with the local government purchasing state-of-the-art equipment, the stream keeper groups through advocacy, through this sheepdog approach, and all of a sudden, the North Shore Streamkeeper Group has attracted a number of young graduate students that are doing watershed research now on various watershed components. So now they have stepped up and said, look, I, can, I know how to run this equipment. I'll help the Streamkeeper Groups. We can work on this sampling together. So here's an example of where young scientists with very strong technical skills are getting together with the stream keeper groups, they're sharing knowledge and information. They're going out and they're collecting data that's gonna be used by ourselves for our watershed plant, right? So that's just one idea of, of lifting the knowledge base of your local stewardship groups is attracting and getting and collaborating with young scientists who have a real genuine interest and passion for watershed. You, you snuck back in the room, I know you had a question, so, um, we're gonna let June. Do you have? Would you have a little question, no, June? Okay. No. Are you sure? Yeah. We, we have time. I'm fine. Okay. So, thanks, Zoanne. Uh, all the work you have done. Zoanne has a creek and a salmon hatchery named after her in North Van. <laughs> it's lit. <laughs> Initiative. Seeing an opportunity binding and sheepdogging endlessly towards making this a reality. And now it's really a collaboration, right? The district will come down and we'll provide equipment to clean sediment out of the channels, the traps, we'll provide woody debris that go in different ponds that they're rearing coho and chunk salmon. Wonderful, thank you so much for coming, Joanne. <laughs>